few figures in history have generated such an enduring fascination and terror as the shadowy figure of Jack the Ripper. This relentless killer stalked the gaslit streets of Victorian London, leaving a trail of mutilated bodies and unanswered questions that have captivated sleuths, historians and the public for over a century. This gripping history delves into the dark heart of Whitechapel, unveiling the chilling details of the murders, the tireless pursuit of justice and the numerous theories that still fuel heated debate over the identity of this brutal enigmatic killer. Whitechapel District of London in the late 1800s served as the perfect backdrop for a spine-chilling tale of murder and mystery. A seething cauldron of poverty, vice and desperation, the area was plagued by overcrowding, rampant crime and squalid living conditions. Amidst this urban chaos, prostitution thrived, providing the Ripper with a vulnerable pool of potential victims ripe for exploitation by a cunning, merciless predator. Between August and November 1888, a reign of terror descended upon Whitechapel as five women fell prey to a faceless killer, later dubbed Jack the Ripper. Known as the Canonical Five, the victims Marianne Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly suffered horrific fates at the hands of a remorseless butcher. The gruesome nature of the murders, marked by slashed throats, mutilated abdominals, and in some cases the removal of organs, fueled speculation that the killer possessed anatomical expertise, pointing to a potential doctor or butcher lurking in the shadows. The first known victim, Mary Ann Nichols, was found in the early hours of August the 31st, 1888. She had left a pub at midnight, intending to earn more money after spending her earnings. Her body was discovered with her throat cut and evidence of further violence. Witnesses later recalled seeing her speaking with a mysterious man before her death. The second victim, Annie Chapman, was last seen on September the 7th laughing with a man in a dark suit and hat. Her body was found at 6 a.m. with a deep cut across her throat and similar injuries to the first victim. The murderer took certain organs, escalating the level of violence. The third victim, Elizabeth Stride, was spotted on September the 29th outside the pub with a man. Her body was found at 1 a.m. with a cut throat it is believed that the arrival of a horse and a rider scared off the killer, preventing further mutilation. However, less than an hour later, another murder occurred. The fourth victim, Catherine Eddowes, was seen speaking with a man fitting the killer's description shortly after being released from jail for drunken behavior on the same night as Elizabeth Stride's murder. Eddowes' body was found at 1.45 a.m., displaying increased levels of brutality. In addition to the injuries seen in previous victims, her face had been mutilated. The police discovered clues near the crime scene, including a blood-stained wall with a cryptic message and a piece of the victim's clothing. The final known victim, Mary Jane Kelly, was significantly younger than the other victims at 25. She had moved to London for work, but ultimately ended up in prostitution. On November the 9th, she was seen again with a man resembling the killer's description at a local pub. The following morning, her remains were discovered in her home. The brutality of this murder surpassed all previous cases with severe mutilation and removal of organs. The Metropolitan Police and the City of London Police joined forces in a desperate bid to apprehend the elusive killer. 
hindered by a lack of forensic technology and a staggering number of potential suspects, detectives embarked on a painstaking process of interviewing witnesses following leads and sifting through a torrent of false confessions. As the investigation intensified, the media's insatiable appetite for the stories ignited a frenzy of fear and a fascination that spread far beyond the borders of Whitechapel. The manner of the mutilations led the police to consider butchers, slaughterers, surgeons and physicians as possible suspects. However, a note from Major Henry Smith, acting commissioner of the city police, reveals that the alibis of the local butchers and slaughterers were checked, and they were cleared of any involvement. According to Inspector Swanson's report to the Home Office, 76 butchers and slaughterers were investigated, along with all their employees from the past six months. Queen Victoria and others at the time believed that the killer was likely a butcher or a cattle drover on one of the cattle boats that regularly travelled between London and mainland Europe, given the murder's pattern. However, Examination of the boats revealed that the murders' dates did not align with any of their movements and crew members' transfer between the boats were also ruled out. The chilling moniker Jack the Ripper emerged from the murky depths of a letter sent to a London news agency, purporting to be from the killer himself. The authenticity of this letter, along with several other communications allegedly penned by the murderer, has been subject of much debate. Nonetheless, the name caught the public's imagination, cementing the killer's place in the annals of criminal history. In the absence of a definite answer to the Ripper's identity, a dizzying array of theories and suspects has emerged, each more compelling than the last. Some of the most intriguing suspects include Montague John Druid, a barrister and schoolteacher whose untimely suicide shortly after the final murder raised eyebrows. His own family harbored suspicions and his name featured in a police memorandum. Aaron Kosminski, a Polish-Jewish immigrant residing in Whitechapel, whose mental instability led to his confinement in an asylum. A controversial DNA analysis involving a shawl, allegedly linked to one of the victims, casts suspicion on Kosminski, but the evidence remains hotly contested. Francis Tumblety, an American quack doctor with a checkered past, Known for his deep-seated hatred of women, Tumblety was in London during the murders, leading some to speculate that he was the elusive Ripper. Thomas Catbush, a mentally unstable individual who was committed to an asylum after attacking two women, a newspaper investigation claimed he was Jack the Ripper, but the police dismissed the allegations. Walter Sickard, a well-known painter who lived in London during the time of the murders. Crime novelist Patricia Cornwall famously accused Sickard of being the Ripper, based on her analysis of his paintings and alleged links to the case. However, many experts have dismissed this theory as tenuous at best. James Maybrick, a cotton merchant who was allegedly poisoned by his wife, a controversial diary surfaced in the 1990s, purporting to be Maybrick's confession to the Ripper's murders. While some believe it to be genuine, others dismiss it as an elaborate hoax. By the passage of more than a century, the identity of Jack the Ripper remained shrouded in mystery, leaving many questions unanswered. 
The case continued to intrigue and perplex historians, criminologists and amateur detectives alike, who relentlessly pursued new leads and revisited old evidence in the hope of finally unmasking the infamous killer. Theories and suspects were scrutinized, debated and discarded, yet the definite answer to the river's identity remained tangalizingly out of reach. One of the key legacies of the Czech the Ripper case was the emergence of modern forensic techniques. The case was one of the first in which forensic science played a significant role in the investigation. The use of blood analysis and other techniques helped investigators to build a profile of the killer and narrow down the suspect pool. This was a turning point in the way that law enforcement approached investigations and it helped to establish the field of forensic science as a critical tool in solving crimes. The case also highlighted the importance of psychological profiling in criminology. The killer's motives and personality traits were extensively studied by investigators and experts and this helped to shape the way that criminologists approached the study of criminal behavior. Today, profiling is a key tool in criminal investigations and is used to help identify suspects and prevent future crimes. Finally, the Jack the Ripper case underscored the need for better communication and coordination between law enforcement agencies. The investigation was hampered by pure communication and the absence of a centralized police force and this contributed to the killer's ability to evade capture. The case ultimately led to reforms in the way that law enforcement agencies collaborate and share information, which has had a lasting impact on the field of criminology. Overall, the Jack the Ripper case was a pivotal moment in the history of criminology and its legacy continues to influence the field today. The chilling tale of Jack the Ripper continued to captivate audiences worldwide. The sinister figure who once stalked the gaslit streets of Victorian London remained a potent symbol of evil, a cautionary reminder of the darkness that lurked in the hearts of men. The unsolved mystery of the Ripper's identity and the gruesome nature of his crimes struck a chord with the collective imagination, ensuring that the legend of Jack the Ripper would endure for generations to come.